Preseason week one is in the books. We had some big winners, some big losers on the Titans side of the ball. We're going to go through it all today. This is the Music City Audible podcast. Let's get to it. We did exactly what we wanted to do in this football game. Trust me, from a coaching staff uh, standpoint and the players, they understand, they understood what the goal was. And the goal was not to win the football game. All right, as much as people want to make that, we lost, whatever, it, that wasn't the goal. This is preseason. We went out there and we were able to execute and put our guys in some situations that you just can't get in practice. Winning was not the goal, Justin. That's what Coach T said after the game in his press conference. Coach T acting as the head coach for this game. Uh, an, a cool move by Mike Vrabel that we talked a lot about. But winning wasn't the goal. It is only preseason extension of training camp. Essentially, the goal is to go out, execute situations, and stay healthy. I think the Titans accomplished that for the most part. How you doing, Justin? I'm doing well. Uh, I, I thought Coach T, you know, it, it, that can go both ways, right? I think a lot of fans looked at that and said, well, the goal is always to win, right? I mean, Malik Willis stepped up to the podium and said, no, you always want to win when you step on the field. Yep. Sort of contradicting what Coach T said just moments earlier. But <laughs> at the same time, you know, the ultimate goal is to win the division, make the playoffs. That's not, you, this game doesn't impact that, right? So the wins and losses don't matter during the preseason. So they talked about executing situational football. They talked about wanting to see certain players move up and down, how they respond to playing time in certain situations. Coach T brought up uh, trying to kick a long field goal, right? Getting yourself into situations where you're kicking field goals. They obviously have a battle going on there that you and I will touch on. So while the the comment was certainly a bit strange, uh, winning wasn't the goal, I I could also understand where Coach T's coming from. Right. And we're going to talk about winners and losers from the game today. Guys who, you know, played well, played better than we expected. Guys who didn't perform as well as hoped. Uh, But before we get into that, I want to remind everyone, subscribe to this YouTube channel if you don't mind. We're going to have videos coming out all week. We're going to be talking about training camp practices, uh, joint practices with the Minnesota Vikings coming up this week. We're going to do a preseason week two preview coming out this week. And uh, the the preview is going to be only on YouTube. So if you're listening to the audio of this, head over to youtube.com slash at Music City Audible podcast and subscribe to that channel give us a like and drop a comment below who were your biggest winners and biggest losers in this game we're going to start with the quarterback battle what would you assign Malik Willis and Will Levis for this game were they winners were they losers it's almost like they're kind of neutral to me yeah it's fairly neutral I I I wouldn't call either of them a loser in all honesty agreed I would probably stop short of calling them winners if that makes sense so if you are handing out neutral Yeah, I think Malik is a winner, and it's not necessarily because of how he played in this game on its own, but compared to last year, he still has a lot to work on, of course, but I think he showed a lot of improvement. He was a lot more sped up in his processing. He was, you know, better at getting out of the pocket when he felt pressured. Not every time. He obviously had a a fumble on a strip sack. He threw a pretty bad interception that was high. There's a lot of debate about this on Twitter. Should Josh Wiley have caught the pass? We'll get to Josh Wiley in a minute. Maybe... But that's your six seven tight end. That's the tallest like receiving option on the roster, and you overshoot him. He's wide open in a really clean pocket. That was yeah. just getting this out of the way. That was on Malik. There's no debate in my mind. I think that that is clear to me. And there's going to be people who want to defend him, and I get it. You want to defend the exciting young quarterback, but come on, you got to make a better pass in that situation. So there were obviously still some negative plays, but overall from last year, the progression to what we see now, the operation, he had one early delay of game penalty, but in general, he was making checks at the line of scrimmage. He executed the two minute drive before the end of the first half and got the spike in time, despite the Bears backup defense trying to like hold whoever it was trying to hold him down and like keep the ball down to make the clock tick. But they got set Malik got the spike and they executed an end of the half field goal. So overall, I think Malik was a winner. Yeah, I think there's no denying it was significantly better than it was last year, right? Like, that's what we've talked about all training camp long. He's showing improvements. The staff is, has mostly been filled with praise for him. I thought he gave a really good, honest answer the other day. I, I, I think it was a, a, a clip Paul Kuharski tweeted when uh, talking about the comfort, comfort level this year compared to last year. And he said that I never call the play in the huddle in college, like coming into, la- into my rookie season. So, uh, no, anyone denying that it wasn't better, I mean, you, you're lying to your yourself you, you'd be foolish to think so uh his, his his a lot of what you said right his process was sped up i thought he was a lot more decisive one thing you didn't really mention there that i think he, he earned a lot of praise for was um when he did escape the pocket he kept his eyes downfield 
right? That yeah. was night and day difference from everyone remembers week one of the preseason last year when he got pulled for escaping the pocket and running when he had an open receiver and just wasn't comfortable enough to go through his progressions and let the ball go. All of that stuff definitely got better. There, there's no doubt about that. I think some of the negative plays you mentioned are, are also worth acknowledging. You talked about the interception. Um, I'm essentially in agreement with you. I put like 90% of that on Malik, maybe 10% of it on Wiley. Cause you sure you'd like yeah. to see him make a play for his quarterback, but you, I mean, you said all three points I wanted to say there were the pocket was so clean. That's your tallest receiving option on the team. And he was wide open, right? Like you've got to make that. There's no reason Josh Wiley should have to jump for that ball, right? Like just right. put it on the numbers. There wasn't a defender within five to seven yards of him. And 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 again, the <laughs> pocket was so clean. There's no, there's no having to speed up that throw. There's no, oh, any sort of discomfort with making that throw. So, and then you talk about the strip sack. You'd like to avoid those things. You talked about the delay of game. It's funny. I thought when the delay of game happened, I thought it, uh, and Mike Herndon, I saw tweeted it, our our pal Mike, where it's like the play before that was the 30-yard completion to Chris Moore, the first play of the game, I believe, where he escaped the pocket, kept his eyes downfield, kept the play alive with his legs, and made a play out of structure. And, and, and kudos to Chris Moore as well, I think, for making himself available to his quarterback on what was a broken-down play. Um, that was great. And then the next play was the delay of game. And I'm like, well, that's the full Malik Willis experience, right? He, he makes something yeah. happen with his athletic ability. And then uh, I'm going to let you interject here. Go ahead. The only thing I'll say about that in his defense, and I tweeted about it too. It was like, oh, come on. There's the operational stuff Mike Vrabel's talking about. Right off the bat, we get a delay of game. But Malik talked about this in the post game. They were a little slow because of the review. So Chris Moore on that 30-yard catch, if you remember, he got lit up from the blind side running down the field. Zero awareness on his part. Like, come on, you're running down the field. You know somebody's going to be coming to tackle you. And almost fumbled the ball, managed to hold on to it. So they had to review that play. So there was a little bit of a delay in getting up to the line and getting the play call in. But that said, he did have time. He was, like, making a check as the play clock expired. So they had time to get to the line of scrimmage, but it was a little slower because of that. So that's the only little like leeway I'll give him for that one. That's fair, but it's going to happen in the regular season too. Oh yeah. Right. So it's, it, you gotta be, again, you talk about executing situations, stuff like that's going to happen. You got to be prepared for that. And you don't want to take the delay of game penalty ever, but ultimately, no, I, I would agree with you. Like the turnovers were very unfortunate. That's what stopped me maybe just short of labeling him a winner, but I yeah. guess I'll go ahead and give out the winner label because <laughs> it was way better than it was last year, right? There's no doubt about that. All the improvement that we've heard about at the training camp practices all summer long, I, I do think you saw that uh, against the Bears on Saturday. Yeah, and uh, you know, you look at Will Levis on the other side of things here as we try to compare these two and we want both of these guys to be successful quarterbacks, right? It's a competition. Absolutely. One of them's going to win. One of them's going to lose and become the QB two. I think after this game, Malik Willis is still ahead. Levis has shown, you know, that he can maybe play at this level, but he's got things to improve on. Held the ball too long a couple of times. He missed Gavin Holmes on what would have been a game winning touchdown, most likely assuming the defense doesn't give up a, a touchdown with 15 seconds left or whatever. Um, on a play where he did a great job to avoid pressure in the pocket, get out, get outside, keep his shoulder square, keep his footwork clean, and he just missed just outside the outstretched hands of the diving receiver. If he puts that one on the money, Gavin Holmes walks into the end zone. So there's a few plays he'd like to have back. Of course, the interception that was you know the last offensive play of the game, which apparently there was a miscommunication. He expected the receiver to be in a different spot, but he's still throwing it into quadruple coverage. So you got to make a better read on that one. But uh, I thought he did a really nice job. I mentioned a couple times he held the ball too long, but then there were other times that he avoided the pressure. He used his legs. He picked up a first down. He ended up with six rushing yards just from that one play, which was a nice run. And he uh, actually, I think it, it set up a third and one. Either way, he slid down to avoid, you know, taking the big hit, which is a always a thing with like mobile rookie quarterbacks is protecting your body because in college you can get away with kind of throwing your shoulder into people. And we saw Will Levis do that at Kentucky. So it was good to see him have the awareness to slide down. His operation was also super clean. No, no pre-snap penalties really with Levis on the field. Um, making a lot of checks at the line of scrimmage, so showing an early grasp of the offense. And Malik did that as well. So I think there were a lot of positives that these guys can take away and build on going into the next game as they continue to compete. Will Levis obviously will need to be a little bit better situationally holding the ball too long, hitting those you know plays that could be touchdowns. you got to hit on those. But overall, I, I was Fairly impressed with him for his first ever NFL action. 
I was too. I think you touched on all the negatives and I agree with them. Look, you don't want to throw the game ceiling interception miscommunication or not. You <laughs> want to hit Gavin Holmes uh, on that play there. That, that could have been a, a walk-in winning touchdown. Uh, you, you, you talked about the uh, holding onto the ball, which Tim Kelly, offensive coordinator on Monday, talked yeah. about a lot. He said they gave up eight sacks and probably half of them were a result of the quarterbacks holding onto the ball too long. I think all of that is true, but it's important, I think, to add some some context to this, right? Like, A, you think about Malik Willis last year, it was, it was a lot better, right, for, for Will Levis uh, than it was for Malik. And we expected that, right? We knew coming in, he had run a, a pro-style offense under Liam Cohen in Kentucky. His college football experience was completely different from Malik Willis's at Liberty. And I think you saw that on the field. I, I, I think you saw a better prepared uh, sort of to be a pro Will Levis in his first game, in his first year of action than, than you did Malik Willis last season. Um, I, I, and co- adding to that context, look around the league, look at some of these rookie quarterbacks, right? Like CJ Stroud threw a terrible interception on one of his first plays of the game where yeah. he stored, he stared down the receiver for what felt like what two, three seconds. And you can't, I, I, I pick off that pass in my, in my Saturday flag football league, right? <laughs> like it's, he's staring him down. There was just that, that sense of hesitancy, that young quarterback hesitancy to let it go, to trust what he sees. That was a bad interception by CJ Stroud. Anthony Richardson of the Colts threw an even worse interception in my opinion, where he was off balance, a very ill-advised throw off his back foot. He also put a couple balls right on the money, Anthony Richardson, that Colts receivers dropped. So I want to be honest there as we're talking about a division rival. But you saw those rookie bumps and bruises. Bryce Young was four of six for 21 passing yards like and took a bunch yeah. of big hits. Like Talk about a just a, a, a nothing. There's nothing there, right, to really discuss on Bryce Young's debut. So, And if you look at all four of them, including Will Levis in that conversation, the first four rookie quarterbacks selected, I believe he had the highest uh, yards per attempt uh, out of all of them. And it was by a fairly wide margin. Like He, he was letting that thing go. And I think one play you failed to mention uh, was I thought his best throw of the game. Was that the one to Mason Kinsey where he rolled out of the pocket, he rolled to his right, he bought himself time, and he hit Kinsey for a first down, which ended up being a, a, a pretty big gain. I thought I thought that was the shades of Will Levis you want to see, right? Yeah. Using that big frame, that athletic ability to roll out of the pocket, keep a play alive, keep his eyes downfield, and he found Mason Kinsey, as I said. So there was some good and bad, I agree. Yeah, I think he had two plays that I'd put above that one even. One of them was the third and 13 conversion to Racy McMath where he kind of like uh, almost like pump faked right before he threw it. He threw, gave a little pump fake, which held the cornerback. It was one of those high low reads against zone coverage. And he the cornerback was pretty low already. But giving that extra little pump just made sure that McMath would be open. And then he hit him right there. McMath falls to the ground catching the ball. My first look, I thought the throw was a little low. But really, I think McMath, for some reason, just like wanted to make sure he made the catch. So he like cradled it and fell to the ground. That was a great play to convert a third and 13, which was huge. And then his other one was he read a hot blitz. Or he read a blitz and hit his hot receiver option, which was really nice pre-snap identifying the blitz, knowing exactly where to go with the ball. Didn't hold it too long through an accurate pass, which I think was a, it was like a second and seven that turned into a first down too. So uh, that one was to Kiaris Jackson. So two really good plays there and as in addition to the one you mentioned. So yes, yeah, some good and a little bit of bad. Absolutely. I think to put a bow on this conversation, you and I are in full agreement that um, we're pleased with both of their performances. I, I, I think the arrow's uh, mo- you know, pointing up for both of them. Uh, as of now, Malik Willis is, is still the, the rightful number two quarterback. But remember, he, he, he kind of has to be, right? He better be, because in all honesty, like I don't think they've ever kept three quarterbacks on the initial 53-man roster uh, throughout the Mike Vrabel era. They certainly didn't last year, when a lot of us thought they would, right, because of Logan Woodside having the experience and Malik maybe not being ready to play. And they still didn't do it last year. So they don't like keeping three quarterbacks on the fit. Almost no, no NFL team likes keeping three quarterbacks on the 53 man roster. And I promise you when we get to end of August, beginning September, let's analyze every single 53 man roster in the league. Very few of them are going to have three quarterbacks on that roster. Very few of them. So while I, I, I do still lean towards the Titans will, I think they will have three. It's very important that Malik Willis is the number two, because in all honesty, if he fought, because they, we know they're keeping Will Levis, obviously, even if he's right. the number three quarterback. Second so round the point pick is, this year. If Will yeah. Levis surpasses Malik Willis on the depth chart and is the number two, um, you have less reason to keep three, to keep Malik Willis around, right? So and it's important that we'll I think he, he, he keeps that job. He's, he, he keeps being the number two quarterback. I think right now he is, but it's worth monitoring going forward. Definitely. And we'll see about that this year because of the new emergency quarterback role that might, you know, 
encourage some teams it to helps. keep three quarterbacks. But you still got to keep one on the 53, right? Like yeah, in order exactly. in order to take advantage of that rule. So I don't think there's going to yeah. be a situation, and we, we, you and I can revisit this conversation, but this is not going to be a situation, I think, where we're looking around the league. I don't think and we're going to have 25 teams that have three quarterbacks on the – like a few of them will take advantage of that rule. But I certainly I think less than half the league will keep three quarterbacks. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. So overall on the day, Malik Willis finished 16 of 25 for 189 yards at 7.6 yards per attempt with that one interception, the one loss fumble, quarterback rating of 70.3, took four sacks but only lost 13 yards total on four sacks. Meanwhile, Will Levis was 9 of 14, which is the disparity there is kind of interesting. Malik Willis threw 25 passes, Levis only 14. I'd like to see a little bit more of an even split in next week's game, but we'll, we'll talk about that later this week. Uh, Will Levis, 9 of 14 for 85 yards, 6.1 yards per attempt, so significantly lower yards per attempt. One interception, also took four sacks for 15 total yards compared to 13 for Malik, and a QB rating of 51.2 uh, Levis also had one carry for six yards. Malik had three carries for 22 yards and the touchdown on the opening drive, fourth down play, which was really nice. And if you look at their PFF grades, which obviously we're always going to take those with a grain of salt, Malik Willis was the fourth highest graded Titans player on offense with an overall grade of 76.9. Will Levis was the fifth worst graded player on the Titans offense, 46.4 overall grade. So PFF saw a lot of things in their film study that said Malik was way better. I don't know if that really passes the eye test for me, but anyway, why don't you throw out another winner or loser from this game? Uh, undrafted free agent defensive back Eric Garr right, that I, I thought looked really good in this game. Made a bunch of open field tackles. One of them I had tweeted out. Uh, uh, I expected more people to jump on me, by the way, for the awful camera angle, but not enough people did. Um, uh, <laughs> so but that, then his, co- his, like, uh, his coach retweeted it from college football. I ever, like The tweet went wild. I was shocked such few people uh, pointed out how terrible uh, the video was. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I thought he made a, several nice open field tackles. Certainly is working his way up. Um, this depth chart, in my opinion, and Mike Vrabel said after the game, and, and this will be something you and I will monitor going next week into Minnesota against the Vikings. Some guys moved up the depth chart. Some guys moved down. Right. And, and, and we're going to pay close attention to that as the week develops. And as that game arrives, of course, I thought Eric, uh, I, I thought he moved up the depth chart. I thought he played really well. Um, they talked about him. Shane Bowen did on Monday said we appreciate how, you know, he played inside a lot, especially in college, yeah. an undersized guy. We appreciate that he's learning to play outside, and he looked good doing it uh, against the Bears. So I, I think he's a very clear winner for me. Very excited for him and his opportunity to continue uh, this trajectory that we're seeing from him. He's been good in training camp quietly. I've had conversations with people around the team that are excited about him, and um, I, I thought he was a clear-cut winner for me, and I, I feel good um, labeling him here as my top winner, first guy that I'm bringing up personally. Um, according to PFF, he played 15 snaps in the slot and 12 outside. So showing off the versatility, I I agree with you. I thought he was a guy that I I wasn't super familiar with. I heard his name a couple times in training camp reports, but he, he showed up big time in this game. I'll throw out another one here and this one's obvious, but I want to talk about him. Tajay Spears got the opening drive with the first team offensive line who also looked good. I want to name them as a winner in a second spoiler alert, but Tajay Spears looked really good to me. Finished the game with six carries for 32 yards. 5.3 5.3 yards per carry, including a 14-yard run where he stiff-armed Eddie Jackson into, like, just ethered him into the earth, which was amazing. Um, and I got people on Twitter telling me it wasn't a stiff arm. Multiple people commenting on my tweet that that was not a stiff arm. Like, are you blind? Of course it was a stiff arm. Uh, but Tajay Spears looked really good. He also got a reception in. He had one catch for four yards, but it was on a first down play, I think. A first or second down set up a, a manageable next play. So that was nice to see. And then he got down to the goal line and couldn't get it in. You know, that was a little bit on the offensive line, a little bit on him. Malik Willis converts it on fourth down. But I think, you know, at least this year, his role is not going to be the one yard line back. That's obviously where you bring in the king, Derrick Henry, for (laughs) what, you know, what has uh, over 100, I think, career touchdowns with the Titans or whatever. He is the franchise record for rushing touchdowns with the Titans. So that's not necessarily Spears' role. I thought he looked really good. He's going to be such a good change of pace back for Derrick Henry this year. And I think we're going to be able to see Henry's workload lightened because of how effective Spears can be with the ball. I thought he looked great in this game. I thought he looked really good. It was, it was as advertised, right? It was the prospect that I loved at Tulane. It was the prospect that looked so damn good, electric, dynamic at the senior bowl. Um, 
he 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 the prince that was promised, right? What Darrington Evans <laughs> was supposed to be, I think, uh, is an appropriate way to put it. Uh, he looked explosive. He looked dynamic. The change of direction, everything, right? The ability to cut on a dime, speed in the open field, very difficult to tackle, elusive. Uh, you said it. I mean, the number two, but this is, there's no competition. There's no question. This is their number two back um, going forward. That's what they drafted him to be. That's what he's going to be. I was extremely pleased with his performance. Yeah. And I think the fact that he only played with the first team offensive line on that one series shows again, his status with the team and the fact that he is the clear cut number two running back. Do you have another winner or loser for me? Well, why don't we get into the first team offensive line uh, that you wanted to talk yeah. about? They played 12 snaps together, um, and I thought they looked good. You had a couple of Bears starters in there on the defensive line. They didn't give up any sacks despite playing against the, you know some Bears starters on the defensive line. One guy I want to immediately shout out is, is first-round pick Peter Skaronsky because I didn't see enough yeah. praise and love for him on Twitter, at least in my opinion. I was watching him very closely throughout that first drive. They played 12 snaps together again, by the way, the first team O-line did. And I thought Peter Skaronsky looked really good. Like There were a couple of drives where I saw a D-tackle. Uh, I don't know who it was, but they were trying to clearly hit him with power. You just saw him anchor down, roll his hips, and move him backwards. He was creating movement off the line of scrimmage. I thought he was really, really good. I'm so excited about him. I thought Andre Dillard was was quite good at left tackle as well. I mean, they all were. I'm going to give you an opportunity to interject here because I can go on about all five of them. Then I do want to talk about the right tackle because that might be the one negative that I have. But I thought Andre Dillard, yeah. Peter Skaronsky, I thought they looked really good. Aaron Brewer, I think, was the highest rated Titan per pro football focus. But Skaronsky was one that really stood out to me. Yeah, I was about to say that. Skaronsky, you know, he had a, a one play that you might want back, which was down near the goal line. He was climbing to the second level, and the linebacker cracked him really hard and, and knocked him like off his path. And that was the one play that Skaronsky was probably like, whoa, okay, this is the NFL. But for the most part, I agree. He was super solid in his debut. And another example of a guy that they clearly feel good about because he only played those 12 snaps, didn't come in with the backup offensive line, even just to like get reps in and get working. They felt like they're comfortable with where he is, so he didn't need to. You mentioned Aaron Brewer, highest graded Titans player on offense in this game, 81.9 overall grade. Uh, Daniel Brunskill was second, 79.9. So great showing by those two guys. Andre Dillard was ninth. Uh, with a 70.0 to overall grade. So all three of your offensive linemen that you kind of had questions about, I guess, and and then p- throw Peter Skaronsky in there. He didn't grade as highly on pro football focus, but I thought he did well. And then the one area where you're maybe a little concerned is Chris Hubbard. He was the lowest graded of the Titans starting offensive line, 22nd overall highest graded Titan on pro football focus, 57.8 overall grade. He was the one guy that you like you knew going in, he was probably not going to be the the best guy you know we have we're hesitant about Andre Dillard because of how much he's had to play hasn't had to play in the last few years we're hesitant about Peter Skronsky because he's a rookie we're hesitant about Aaron Brewer because he's changing positions we're hesitant about Daniel Brunskill because he's a career backup who's now going to be a starter but all those guys showed out and played well you're obviously concerned about the right tackle because Chris Hubbard signed off the street a few you know days ago and Nicholas Petitfrier suspended who we'll get to in a second um could have been better, right? Those that's the one guy that could have been better, but overall he held his own. He wasn't like he was the I guess the weak weak link, but if you have just one weak link on your offensive line, you can help him out with the tight end over there with the running back and pass protection and uh, moving guys, you know, with combo blocks in the run game to help that position out. I thought he was good enough to maintain the lead for the right tackle job, especially when you t- when you look at how the backup offensive line played. Well, I, I think that's a fair point where, yeah, he probably maintained the lead, but I, I'm not going to give him too much credit for that. I agree it's more so because the backup offensive line looked so bad. Um, Hubbard yeah. got beat real cleanly on that one pass pro rep by uh, Bears defensive end Rasheem Green, who's an underrated uh, football player. He used to play for the Houston Texans. Titans know him well. I thought he beat him real cleanly on that. And I, I, I came away from this game, that, that 12 snap showing, I think a bit more concerned than you did. I, I think you bring up some good points where if he's the one weak link, you can hide it a little bit. You offer help. You just got to get by, right, essentially on that side. But yeah. I, I was hoping to see better from him, and I didn't. Yeah, and, and that's, you know what, it is what it is. Like, it was only 12 snaps. Maybe in more snaps he would have done even worse, but he's <laughs> got to be the clear-cut second because I'll throw out some losers here for you. Some losers were, I mean, mostly the entire backup offensive line minus Justin Murray and Corey Levin. Those guys played well, but Andrew Rupsich had a pretty rough, ga- pretty rough game. Zach Johnson was 
horrible in this game. I don't even know if he survives the week on the, the you know, the rest of the week on the team. Like they, that's a position they could be churning. They know they need offensive line depth. And he was really bad. Didn't look like an NFL player to me. Nicholas petit Friere, who's supposed to start, you know, he's got the first six games suspended, but coming back, you expect him to be your starting right tackle. He was not good. Only played uh, 17 snaps. How many pressures did he give up? Like four pressures in those 17 snaps. 13 pass blocking snaps. Yeah. Gave up four pressures. That's one pressure every four snaps, essentially. That's horrible. I mean, this is a guy who's got to be getting back into things, but he's not, it's not like he's been sitting out of training camp just because he's suspended. He's not going to be away from the team until the end of training camp. So... That was not a good showing for him. I think overall the tackle depth did not look good. I was hoping for better things from Andrew Rupsich, and you just we didn't get it in this game. Yeah, I mean, we could label the entire backup O-line losers, right? And and that's a pretty common theme for most teams around the NFL if you paid attention to Twitter this weekend. But uh, you're right, Zach Johnson did not look good at all. Andrew Rupsich, I thought that was interesting that he came in as the second team right tackle. It seemed it like they're giving him the most opportunity uh, to replace Chris Hubbard at right tackle, but there's 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 no way in heck he he closed the gap in that competition, right? Like he gave up a, a team high five pressures. He did play the most snaps out of any offensive lineman on the team. I believe it was 46 total snaps for Andrew Rufsich. They obviously wanted to see a lot of him as they give a young player a, a chance to be the starting right tackle for the first couple of weeks. But he did not look good. Uh, I thought Jalen Duncan was okay. I, I don't think at least I do not think Jalen Duncan was as bad as Andrew Rupsich and Zach Johnson were. That that was encouraging, especially because he's a you know a young sixth round pick that had to play both left and right tackle uh, throughout this game. That's not easy, and I've, I've talked about that all summer long. That that's not going to be easy for him because he played left tackle exclusively at Maryland. But I want to give you a chance yeah. uh, to come in here because I, I I'm not I'm not going to label him a winner, but I do think he was better than Zach Johnson and Andrew Rupsich were. So I I agree that he was a little better. Duncan had 28 snaps all at left tackle. In um, 18 pass blocking snaps, he gave up four pressures and two sacks. So not not great. I mean, that's PFF charting. I can't remember that. I remember the one for sure that Duncan gave up. I can't remember the other. And all honestly, it's not something that sticks out to me as oh, that was something Duncan gave up. The one I remember yeah. for sure. I think it was he was beaten by Terrell Lewis. I think uh, while he was playing that was left the play tackle, action one. I, yeah, I don't recall the other. But anyway. Um, I think we're, we're confident labeling the whole backup O-line losers. Like you, you said, Corey Levin. I mean, Corey Levin's their sixth best lineman, so that's no surprise that he fared yeah. better than the rest of them. But tackle depths, you know who didn't get into this game is John Ajoku, unfortunately, yeah. as he's still nursing an injury. I'm sure after this performance from Andrew Rupsich, from Zach Johnson, from some of the other guys, I'm sure they're very, very anxious to see John Ajoku. Yeah, me too. And and I hope he gets back healthy soon. Obviously, the Titans are super tight-lipped about injuries. So we have no idea how serious it is or how bad he is, but he hasn't been placed on any kind of list. So that tells you that they expect him to be back at least somewhat soon. Um, let's throw out a few more winners here. I'm going to go with some of these receivers, especially the UDFAs, Kiaris Jackson and Treshawn Harrison. They were in the top five overall of the PFF grading for this game for the Titans on offense. Kiaris Jackson finished only two catches for 34 yards on three targets. Um, but one of them, he made a guy miss and picked up the first down I mentioned earlier on the Will Levis throw. And the other one was on the two-minute drive trying to go down and, and win the game with Malik Willis at quarterback. So two huge plays for Jackson. And then Treshawn Harrison also finished with two catches for 34 yards on three targets. Also had a play on the two-minute drive. So, I mean, these guys who were UDFAs that we were hoping to come out and make plays, nobody on the receiving end had like a huge game. The leading receiver for the Titans was Racy McMath. Three catches, 53 yards. Mason Kinsey was next, four catches for 40 yards. And then it was Jackson and Harrison with 34 yards each. So, you know, they're rotating these guys a lot. They're not getting as much opportunity as they would in like a typical NFL game. So to come out with, you know, 34 yards, you hear that and you think, oh, that's not very productive. But given the amount of snaps they actually played, I think it was good. And I was impressed with both of those guys. So I'm going to put them as winners. I'm going to agree with you quickly on that one because I was very excited to see both of them going into this game. And I, I think... With the context that you added, they met my expectations. They look like guys that are capable of contributing four to 53-man roster spot. Uh, I'm going to quickly shout out Ray Sid McMath and Mason Kinsey because they're not getting any love on, on, on Twitter, on social media. And I feel like it's boring, right? Out with the old, in with the new. So no one wants to give them love. But what did we say about them coming into the preseason? They have to make plays on the ball in order to, to try to compete for a roster spot. Well, look, Ray Sid McMath, as you said, led the team in receiving. Three catches for 53 yards. Mason Kinsey 
McKenzie, a solid performance as well. Four catches for 40 yards. So um, look, they all they can do is make plays when their number gets called, right? As, as they try to convince the Titans to hold on to them. And I thought both of them did that. So all four of those receivers, uh, all, again, although they weren't big time winners, no one went for 80, 90, 100 receiving yards. But I think all four of them uh, did very decent, all things considered. Yeah, I agree. And and um, I also think Reggie Roberson w- had a decent game. He had a really nice sideline catch where he was able to control the ball, get both feet down. They reviewed it and gave him the catch so you know it was real. Um, only two catches for 20 yards. I was kind of hoping to see a little bit more of him. Me too. That connection that we heard so much about just didn't seem present. And there wasn't a whole lot of downfield attacking from the Titans offense overall in this game. Some of that could be you know playing with a backup offensive line. Some of that could be these young quarterbacks a little hesitant to push the ball downfield. I was hoping we might see a little bit more vertical passing game. A lot of stuff was underneath. Um, obviously, there was the 30-yard play to Chris Moore. That was the longest reception of the day for any Titans player, and that was sort of on a broken play. A nice job by Malik, and a lot of yards after catch on that one, too. So nothing that was like a true vertical threat type of play, where I, which is where I thought Reggie Roberson might be able to make some plays. When you talk about these guys making the team, special teams is going to be a huge component. Racy McMath, by far the highest graded player of these guys on special teams. So it was PFF special teams grade. Blew the other guys out of the water. Um, Treshawn Harrison was really low on the list. He was 50th out of 61 players who played on special teams for the Titans. Reggie Roberson, not too far uh, above him. And Kiaris Jackson, about you know 25th overall amongst special teams players for the Titans. So not great either. Racy McMath was ninth overall for t- all Titans players on special teams. So I thought that that's a place where if you know they're going to cement themselves it's going to be on special teams. It's not going to be what they do on offense because all these guys can kind of catch the ball and make plays with it, right? Like we saw that in this game. Who does the best on special teams is going to be truly where the difference is made. I think that's a really good point. And I think Mike Rabel praised a couple of them and some of the young DBs too, like our, our Amani Marsh. Anthony Kendall received some praise as well for how he played on special teams. You you, you mentioned our, our Armani Marsh there. I'll give him a quick shout because he received uh, he received praise from Shane Bowen as well. He had that one snap, I, I believe it was in man coverage, where he was running. He ran step for step with a targeted receiver down the field on an incomplete pass with a bit of an, uh, a deep ball attempt. Step for step, I yeah. thought that was great uh, by our Armani Marsh as well. Mike Brown's received a lot of praise uh, this morning. Mike Herndon was big on. Mike Herndon was big on Mike Brown uh, coming out of that game. And then Shane Bowen said, it's interesting to hear Shane Bowen admit on Monday that they, they, they entered this offseason concerned about the depth at safety, which you and I kind of beat that drum all summer long. And, uh, and they thought they feel a bit better based on how Mike Brown played. And, and, and I think Shaheem Carter received a shout out as well for playing a physical brand of football. But Mike Brown certainly came out of this game a bit of a winner and, and probably improved his chances to make the 53, especially considering what they have at safety. Absolutely. I think safety depth overall was a winner for this game. And I want to include Elijah Molden in that because he only played that first drive uh, with the defense where, you know, didn't play a ton because he's viewed as sort of a starter, only played 14 total snaps. So Elijah Molden in the safety role, he played all 14 of those snaps at, at safety, not at corner, not at slot corner or whatever. So he's fully transitioned. It feels like, and he had a nice play early in the game in in run defense coming up into the box, slipping a block and making a tackle. So Nice to see Molden back out there healthy, making plays, and I think that he's cementing himself as someone who can play safety for this team. You mentioned Mike Brown. I thought Imani Marsh was decent too, although he didn't get a very good grade on PFF. He's He was playing slot cornerback mostly anyway, so not exactly the same thing. But overall, I think the safety depth was a winner. I'm going to say a couple losers here. Nick Westbrook Akina was a big, big loser to me because all offseason, everyone in Titans fans have sort of been like, he's a lock to make the team. He's been here for however many years. He's got the trust of the coaching staff. If that's the case, then why was he playing well into the second half with the offense out there? That is a horrible sign for Nick Westbrook Akina's status on this roster. Look, the coaches aren't going to get up at a press conference or a podium and tell us anything about where any player stands, you know, on the depth chart with the roster. But what they are going to do is... They are going to tell us where those players stand by how they use them when they play in these preseason games. And the fact that Nick Westbury Aquino was out there in the second half. Come on, man. This guy's supposed to be a lock to make the roster. I don't buy it. He played 20 snaps in total, which was the fifth most of the 10 receivers that played for the Titans. Those 20 snaps, 19 for Kiaris Jackson, 18 for Treshawn Harrison. I think those numbers are the most telling for you in regards to where Nick Westbrook Akine is. I agree with you. I wrote an article on it Monday morning uh, for Music City Miracles. I I talked about, you know, three sort of observations from the snap counts. That was my number one observation, 20 snaps for him. 
doesn't seem to indicate that his roster spot is safe. I, 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 I cowardly allowed myself an out in that observation by saying, Look, maybe they wanted to give their, you know, these rookie quarterback Malik Willis and Will Levis. Maybe they wanted to give them one reliable target out there, a guy that knows the playbook is going to run the right routes all the time. But I don't think that's probably the case. I, I, I do think Nick Westbrook probably is in contention for a roster spot, and maybe they don't see a need to keep him, Chris Moore, and Racy McMath, for for example, because all three of them can play special teams and all three of them can play the um, sort of outside receiver position. So. Um, I, I do think there's something there. I think there's something to monitor. Probably not the lock that we assume he is. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to throw out another loser here. I got a few losers in mind, so I'm gonna maybe I'll just rapid fire them and you can comment each one. Josh Wiley had the fumble, which was his big loser moment. We mentioned how the Malik Willis interception was more on Malik than it was on Wiley. That said... Help your quarterback extend those arms. You're six foot seven. He kind of alligator armed it a little bit. A little T Rex arms going up for that ball. You're six foot seven. Go make that catch for your quarterback, buddy. Even if it is not a great pass, and then you got to hold on to the ball. You got to be aware that the defense is coming to knock it out of your arms after you make a catch. So that was, you know, a couple of plays that Wiley would definitely want to have back. And then I think um, Monty Rice is a big loser here in this game. Chance Campbell was playing ahead of him. Obviously, Jack Gibbons, we already know, was playing ahead of him. But then Chance Campbell also playing ahead of him. I thought that that was really interesting. He didn't get – he played, what, seven snaps in this seven game? Seven snaps. He's, which I don't know actually how to feel about that. Is that Same. the coaching staff saying – I was going to cut you <laughs> off and say, I don't, I don't know what to make of that. He's safe. He's not safe. I, 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 right. I don't know. Are it's, they trying to protect yeah, him from injury? Odd. Or are they like, you're not good enough to play enough or we want to see more from the other linebackers we signed. And, you know, on that note, Ben Neiman was the highest graded Titans player on defense. So winner, obviously Ben Neiman winner. I think Chance Campbell, just because he was getting up, he started this game ahead of Monty Rice alongside Jack Gibbons. So pretty interesting what's going on with Monty Rice. I think that's something to track, but I think I'm reading this as loser for him. Maybe they, they just feel good about him and they want to keep him healthy, but he played in the second half. So I don't know if that's right. Like, that was really yeah. bizarre. I have a tough time knowing what to make of that, in all honesty, because it doesn't feel like a guy they wouldn't want to see more from, right? Like, they've talked all right. summer about wanting to see more consistency from him, and he's done some good things, he's done some bad things. It was confusing to me. It was a confusing use of their resources. I, I thought he should have played 20 snaps, you know, d- yeah. triple his the workload that he had. Are they protecting him because he has been a bit injury prone throughout his career and they know he's going to make the 53? I don't know, right? I, I'm in agreement with you. I thought that was strange. With Josh Wiley, like I'll, I'll quickly comment on him. It would be easier to forgive the fumble if – the interception also didn't happen, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. the interception, we, we we are still in agreement that it's more on Malik Willis. We're not changing our tune. But then the fumble happens, and you're just like, come on, dude. Like, that's two negative plays you were in on. One of them, of course, taking direct responsibility for the fumble. It was a good hit by the Bears defender, got his helmet on the ball. But regardless, when you when you were involved in two turnovers and you didn't play a lot of football, uh, you, you have to be labeled the loser. Definitely a disappointing debut for Josh Wyatt. Yeah, I agree. And he'll, he'll, you know, he'll have more chances to get better as his first game, like you said, as an NFL player. So not like it's not the end of his career, obviously, but for this game, he was definitely a loser. Another winner for me, Julius Chestnut. Chestnut was the most productive Titans player in this entire game, totaling 61 yards from scrimmage, seven carries, 46 yards, two catches, 15 yards. He was running hard in the second half and was able to keep the offense on schedule, especially like when they got the ball back with a chance to go win it with what, three or four minutes left on the clock and they're running the ball still almost like you would do if you had Derrick Henry out there and chestnut was productive he was giving them good yards he had a, a long of 26 he had a 26 yard run in this game so the most productive player on offense from scrimmage was julius chestnut i thought he was a winner yeah i'm glad you shout out julius chestnut because there's some interesting things going on there in the backfield that i think are worth touching on number one uh, uh jonathan ward appeared to have suffered a minor injury against the bears uh you know he he was a favorite of you and i to be the number three yeah. back on this team. So that, that we have to monitor and track what the progress is for that injury. I don't know that we'll see him against the Vikings on, on such short turnaround, especially with the, the joint practices coming up. Julius Chestnut looked really good, took advantage of, of an opportunity, led the team in rushing. Uh, Hassan Haskins, like, just is a special teams player, right? Like, I think you're going to agree with me. Like, just the total lack of burst, in all honesty, total lack of explosiveness, um, does not make him a, a traditional running back that you want to run between the tackles, in all honesty. So Cut him. that's three things Cut I him. just pointed out. And I want to point out one more. 
They're working Cut out him. a running back on Monday, yes. right? They're working out uh, Jox Patrick, former Florida State star, played in the XFL most recently. So a lot of moving pieces here at running back with the Ward injury. Haskins not looking very good, working out Patrick. And then I think Julius Chestnut, who I don't want to say that we forgot, but we haven't brought up a ton of, uh, uh, you know, of his chances yeah. to make the 53. You and I haven't talked about that a lot. You know, he made it last year, and we, we almost wrote him off this summer. We thought Jonathan Ward is going to take that spot, but Chestnut looked good. He ran with a sense of urgency. He ran uh, – I thought he was very decisive. I thought he hit those holes uh, with a sense of confidence, and I, I thought he looked really good, in all honesty. Yeah, Haskins, big loser for me. Six carries, 12 yards. He did have that touchdown where he went over the top, but he almost didn't get in. I mean, he did get in, so give it to him. Um, he also returned two kickoffs for 40 yards total, 20 yards apiece. Both kickoffs from the end zone that I thought, you shouldn't even be returning this. Just call fair catch. And maybe he was coached to return it. Let's practice the you know blocking for practice a kick blocking. return, which is fine if that was the case. But if that is the case, he didn't return it well. It's not like he showed off his burst or his vision or ability to be a returner. Look, you're, you keep Hassan Haskins around because he's good on your punt coverage and your kick coverage team, not necessarily as a returner. But man, with all the legal stuff hanging around him, I know they want to wait for the facts to come out. Combine that with like not playing very well. You have Julius Chestnut, who you know can give you good good snaps if you need him. Tajay Spears looked amazing. Obviously, Derrick Henry is your starter. Do you need a fourth running back who's not very good at running the ball? Like, I say cut Haskins. I don't think Haskins deserves a spot on this team with what he did in his personal life and how he's played on the field. So I'm pretty anti-Haskins. Um, I'm going to throw out another winner and another loser, and then I'm, I'm done. If you have any more, you can hit them. Winner, Caleb Shudak. Loser, Trey Wolf. Caleb Shudak made his one field goal attempt. Trey Wolf missed his from 48, no good wide to the right, which, you know, 48's not like a super easy field goal, but you'd like to see in a kicking competition, these guys step up and be able to make it. He had the leg, he was just, in the accuracy, it's kind of what we've talked about. Shudax, 40-yarder, was barely good from 40 yards, not great sign either, so I think the Titans are maybe a little bit in trouble at the kicker position. You'd like to see them get a few more opportunities over the next couple of preseason games to prove that they can kick at an NFL level. Maybe, you know, first kick, as an NFL player for Trey Wolf getting out there, he made the extra point actually, so it wasn't his first kick, but first kick as an NFL player getting out there and you'd like to see him knock it down and he didn't. Caleb Shudak also kicked the ball off out of bounds on a kickoff attempt, so that's also horrible and you don't want to see that because that gives the other team such a huge advantage. So there was a couple, you know, I said Shudak is a winner only because Trey Wolf missed his field goal, not because he kicked particularly well. The kicking game scares me a lot. It's my number one concern about the Titans going into the 2023 season. Because if you can't kick a game-winning field goal to win games, to win close games, if you're missing 40-yard field goals and just leaving points on the field when you have like good drives going and stuff, like you know, you can't do those things and expect to win football games. It's a game of very small margins. You gotta execute every chance you get. And these kickers both scare me. I only said Shudak is a winner because Wolf missed his field goal and Shudak made his. But overall, they both struggled, I think. Yeah, I get what you mean. And I'm going to agree with the last part of that because I'm not going to label any of them winner or, or uh, a winner in all, in all honesty because yeah. I get it. One of them made their field goal. The other one missed it. But against the Vikings, I'd like to see the roles reversed. I want to see Caleb Shudak go out there and attempt a, a long field goal close to 50 yards. And I want to see Wolf get a chance at a 40-yarder because that Shudak 40-yarder, it didn't inspire any confidence, right? That thing was moving a no. lot. It barely snuck in between the uprights. And then he has the kickoff error as well, which was terrible, right? It can't happen. So uh, neither of them are a winner in my book. Uh, I'm keeping a close eye on this thing. I've been worried about it all summer long. Uh, nothing I saw on Saturday inspired confidence. I'm still worried about it. I don't have anything to say about winners and losers, anything else to say about winners and losers, but I will add, uh, end with a piece of news here. Just broke on Twitter by, for me and Rappaport, Titans worked out veteran corner Ronald Darby this morning. That's interesting. So looks wow. like they had a bunch of guys in for workouts. We'll probably get the full list later on Monday. By the time you listen to this, you'll know. Josh Patrick, the running back, was one of them we quickly touched on. And now veteran corner Ronald Darby. That one's more interesting to me uh, because I can't, well, huh. A, he's, you know, he's a better football player. He's been around the league for a little bit. And B, um, I don't know, like, why do they work him out? I'm, I'm curious, right? I, like, we saw Jonathan Ward, as I said, leave the game with injury. It makes sense for the running back workout. I don't recall any of the corners getting hurt. Uh, and they praised the heck out of Trey Avery on Monday morning. Thought he looked really good, they said, against the Bears. So they feel like they need more corner help. I'm, I'm curious where this comes from. We miss Trey Avery. He's a winner. We just got to give him a shout Had out. An he interception. Had a nice interception. In the game as well. So. Yeah. 
And he did give up a, a pass along the sideline that converted for a first down, but I actually thought it was really good coverage against a little stick route out, out on the sideline. Gave up zero yards after catch, was right there to, to, you know, make a play. If it had been an off-target pass, he could have broken it up. It was a good pass from P.J. Walker. He pushed the receiver out of bounds immediately. So even though he gave up a first down, it was a short catch and no no yards after catch. So I thought Trey Avery was, was pretty good in this game, too. I think he gives them some depth at corner. But yeah, we'll see what Ronald Darby's about. That's interesting. But anyway, that will do it for our winners and losers from preseason week one. We'll be back later this week to talk about the training camp joint practices with the Vikings and what we're looking forward to seeing. We're also going to have a preseason week two preview video go up on the YouTube channel. So again, if you're just listening, head over to the Music City Audible YouTube channel, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. And again, comment below. Let us know. Do you agree with our winners and losers list? Who were your biggest winners and biggest losers from this game? Let us know in the comments below. Follow Justin on Twitter at Justin M underscore NFL can follow me at Titans Film Room. Again, we'll be back later this week. So until then, you all stay safe out there and tighten up. A Broadway Sports Media Production.